Okay, hi everybody. My name is Luke. Um, my daughter actually had a hemistrectomy for hemimagal encephaly about five years ago, and her uh, surgery um, worked initially, and then she's had some seizures that have recurred since then. Um, last winter, just a few months ago, we actually uh, underwent DNA sequencing of her brain tissue, and we found a variant in the mTOR gene in her brain. And so uh, her team at Lurie in Chicago has recommended that we move forward with an mTOR inhibitor, which is a, a treatment that um, targets that pathway. Um, I read at the last conference, we, uh, one or two conferences ago, we had just heard about some new research targeting mTOR and HME, and I've been really excited to follow along. Um, Dr. Hopman is a staff neurosurgeon at Seattle Children's and an associate professor of neurological surgery at the University of Washington. Uh, he, I believe, previously studied under Dr. Mathern and with Dr. Lamb at, at UCLA, and uh, he's focused his research on mTOR pathways, among many other uh, aspects of neurosurgery. He's, the, he's been leading the um, clinical trial out of Seattle Children's, focusing on using mTOR inhibitors for surgically refractory epilepsy. And I've been really excited to look forward to this talk today to learn more about uh, mTOR inhibitors and his research. So I'll welcome Dr. Hauptman calling in remotely. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, can you all hear me OK? Yes. yes. OK, great. Um, I am so sorry I can't be there. I am in Utah, but I'm four and a half hours south of you guys camping in Zion <laughs> with my family. Um, and cause every, every year for two weeks, I take my family on a camping trip and this year we're in Zion, but I bet your weather is better than mine. Cause I'm at like 115 degrees down here. So, um, nice of me to give remote, I guess. So uh, I'm going to be fairly informal. Um, like was mentioned, um, I'm up at the university of Washington, um, and, um, my relationship with Gary Mathern goes back a very long time. I um, trained, I was a resident when he was a professor at UCLA. Um, Sandy Lamb and, actually, and I were actually co-residents. We were a year apart. Um, so we both trained together uh, with Gary. Um, and during my residency, I got a PhD. Um, and that PhD was st spent studying what I'm going to talk about in part today. Um, and I continue that work, you know, years later. So I'm going to share my screen and we can talk about stuff. Um, I also want to say that um, I'm really thankful that your group exists. It is a, there's a pressing need for your group in the epilepsy surgery community because the things we do are, are big and intimidating and life changing. And they're not common, you know, when you think about the epidemiology of disease, they're not common. And so connecting families is very, very important. And in fact, earlier last week, before I left on my camping trip, I saw a, a four week old, old baby with hemimegalencephaly is going to require a hemisterectomy and I and the parents who are incredibly sophisticated um, I, I sent to the brain recovery project and they found uh, your web resources very very helpful so thank you for all that you guys do um, what I'm going to talk about today is work that spans a lot of years um, and has sort of culminated in, in a clinical trial that is now ending and hopefully there'll be more. Um, these are, this is who I am. Uh, so I'm, a, I'm an epilepsy surgeon, just like Sandy Lamb or Dave Adelson or Taylor Abel or Gary. Um, and uh, I'm the epilepsy surgeon one of three in, in Seattle. Um, and I'm also pretty involved in the TS community up there. As I'm about to show you, there's such significant overlap likely between TS and the cortical dysplasia spectrum that they, they kind of go together. Uh, before I go any further, I'm going to make one plug. Um, we're having a free epilepsy symposium on September 17th at the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital. 
and it's it's like uh, web based. Um, you can log in through Zoom. If anyone is interested, we'd love to have you. We're going to have a panel of about 15 or 16 experts talk about everything surgery, genetics, which I think is of particular importance to this group because we've done a lot of the genetic work at, at UW and um, and and uh, epilepsy neurology. And so if anyone wants any information about that, um, I could potentially, Luke, send it to you or to Monica. If you guys are interested, just let me know. Um, and uh, I will forward it to you guys. All the work I'm about to show you is not, it's not just me. Um, I talk about it and I did a lot of the <laughs> prep work and groundwork, but I have a phenomenal team of people that I work with and collaborate with. Um, my fellow neurosurgeons and neurologists and medicists, neuropsychologists, I study coordinators. It's a lot, a lot of people that help get this work off the ground. And I love crediting them at the beginning instead of the end because uh, they're just so important, you know, to the work that we've done. Um, just to start at the beginning, you've probably heard this multiple times through the lectures that you've been in in the last couple of days, but I want us to all start at common ground. The reason we have the term epilepsy is because after one single unprovoked seizure, the chances of having a second are only about 40%. But if you have two, the chances of having a third or a fourth are upwards of 75 plus percent up to nine. 90%. And that's what gets your child labeled as having epilepsy. That's the definition. And then, of course, there's treatment resistant epilepsy, which is what led or is going to lead uh, children of people who are attending this conference to meet with an epilepsy surgeon. Um, that definition has been around for longer than I've been a neurosurgeon. It was derived from incredible work that was done over 20 years ago in New England. Um, where every child who was diagnosed with epilepsy was followed throughout their childhood. It was a natural history study. And they found that if a child was on two appropriately dosed and tolerated, meaning they weren't discontinued for side effect, anti-seizure medicines, and they were still having seizures, the chances of a third or a fourth or a fifth conventional, I'm going to use that term specifically because the medication I'm talking about today is not conventional. Conventional anti-seizure medicines, doesn't matter if they're the oldest or the newest, the chances of them ending the, the seizures was less than 5%. If there's a lesion on them, right, excuse me, the chances are even lower. And our feeling as epilepsy neurosurgeons is that if we continue to an exhaustive trial of medications beyond that two medication ceiling, the risk of something bad happening from seizures is way higher than the risk of any surgery that we would potentially offer. And that's how you get to epilepsy neurosurgery. Whether it be an adult or a child, I, I do adult epilepsy surgery as well, and the definitions are identical. The, the, the underlying problems are different, but the way we approach them is very similar. Any questions so far? You want me to keep going? Okay. We see a lot of cortical dysplasia as epilepsy, pediatric epilepsy neurosurgeons. About 15 or so years ago, there was an ILAE survey that was sent out to all the pediatric epilepsy centers asking them to catalog what they saw most frequently to least frequently. And Gary Mathern was a principal author on this, though I think they, they misspelled his name, Barry. I don't know. <laughs> um, and it showed that cortical dysplasia was by far and away the most common etiology that we see in pediatric epilepsy surgery. Okay, about 40% of kids at that time that were getting epilepsy surgery had cortical dysplasia. Now, granted, that survey is a little dated because our indications have expanded quite a bit. You know, the pediatric indications for VNS came out right around this time. And of course, children who have VNS, they don't have necessarily lesional epilepsy. And so th these numbers are going to change a little bit. 
and then with RNS and DBS, which I think you heard about from Taylor Abel yesterday, the indications expanded even more to what we call multifocal epilepsy and sometimes the generalized or Lennox Gastel epilepsies, in which we're now, a lot of us are now doing RNS to the thalamus. Um, but cortical dysplasia from a lesion standpoint is by far and away the most common reason why kids get a resection or a disconnection surgery. Mild forms of cortical dysplasia under the microscope look like some nerve cells took a wrong turn early on in development. The brain essentially forms from the center to the surface. And so the uh, neurons, they all start around the ventricle, which is near the center of the brain, and then they migrate outwards. Imagine a series of nerve cells that took a wrong turn somewhere and they ended up looking upside down, disoriented, um, just not where they should be. That's a mild cortical dysplasia type one. That doesn't mean the disease that type one causes is mild. It just means under the microscope, it looks like a milder form. And then there are more severe forms that we call type two cortical dysplasia in which the nerve cells look really funky. Um, we call them um, uh, dysplastic uh, neurons or we call them uh, cytomegalic uh, inner neurons. Uh, we also call them balloon cells. Um, and they're all different, really funky looking neurons that should not be there, that are there in cortical dysplasia type two. One thing that is key and differentiates cortical dysplasia in young children, as opposed to adults, is that at young children, the seizures generally are worse, they're more frequent, and they're generally outside of the temporal lobe. A first principle in adult epilepsy neurosurgery is that the majority of seizures come from the temporal lobe, and in some ways, it makes treating them with surgery easier. Um, but the majority of children that present with cortical dysplasia, their seizures are coming from outside the temporal lobe. And that adds some complexity with how we approach them surgically and why the outcomes aren't quite as good as they are in adults. Unfortunately, one thing that plagues us, and this will be a theme today, about cortical dysplasia is how do we pick it up? Under the microscope, we can see it, but on MRIs, we can only see it up to half the time. And half the time, cortical dysplasia can be so, dis so indiscreet, so inconspicuous, that an, an MRI, a conventional MRI, won't necessarily pick it up. PET scans, which have now been around for a long time, um, heavily, heavily used in my training, they generally pick it up better. The problem with PET scans is that their spatial resolution, meaning how precise or accurate they are about the area that's involved, is not as good as an MRI. And they generally overestimate the area that's involved, which is why a lot of people are reluctant to necessarily operate, for instance, on just a PET scan because it may incline you to remove or disconnect more brain tissue than is necessary, but it's an unanswered question. Um, focal cortical dysplasias are usually in the frontal or temporal lobes, but as we're learning in focal cortical dysplasia type one, the milder form, it seems like it's probably more diffuse than we even appreciate. And it's probably found in areas quite far away from where we think the seizures are coming from which is a challenge in cortical dysplasia. Hemimegalencephaly is the exact opposite end of the spectrum where one entire hemisphere is essentially completely dysplastic. These are the most recent classifications of cortical dysplasia. But I think what's really important to just think about is that there's a type one that looks really subtle under the microscope and is really hard to detect by MRI and very challenging to treat surgically. And then there's type two, which are way more discreet on, on, under a microscope and ironically are much easier to pick up on an MRI. And the outcomes for type two cortical dysplasia from surgery are actually better because it's a more discreet lesion. Any questions so far? Okay. Here are the fundamental, in my opinion, challenges with operating on cortical dysplasia. Now, to keep in mind, cortical dysplasia is almost half of all pediatric epilepsy resections that are done today. Okay, so it's a tremendous problem. 
surgical challenges. What really is the lesion? Is it just where the nerve cells are abnormal? Is it the area around that? Is it a larger, what we call a network, which is almost like a highway, like the uh, I-5 or I-405 connecting multiple areas of the brain and allowing the epilepsy to travel quickly between areas of the brain? How do we find the lesion? I told you, I told you on that last slide, only half the time can we even pick it up on an MRI. It can be very, very inconspicuous. Even when we can find it, how do we define the border or the boundary? Good brain versus bad brain. Where is that distinction so that we can do a precise epilepsy operation and not remove or disconnect areas of the brain that we don't want it, okay? How do we define the area that's necessary for surgery? How do we find if there's maybe more than one area, what we call dual pathology, which is really common. A child could have cortical dysplasia in the parietal lobe, and they can have mesial temporal sclerosis in the temporal lobe that we don't pick up right away. Maybe it comes out much later. One thing that Gary Mathern and I published on over a decade ago is that even though a lot of the scientific reports from pediatric epilepsy surgeons show really, really high success rates in the short term, when you follow these kids longer, we did a five-year follow-up, and it turns out that maybe we're not doing as well as we thought we were. And we're seeing recurrences. And what do we do with those recurrences? Or kids that transition from pediatric subspecialties to adulthood, for those of you in the room that have adult uh, members of your family who had epilepsy early on in life, maybe I was operating early in life, you know better than anyone that the follow-up is not quite the same because the adult system doesn't really cater as much to the individual as the pediatric system does. So herein lies the problem and what we're going to talk about for the next half hour or so. Cortical dysplasia. We think surgery probably works on the whole about half the time, maybe a little bit better than that. In type 2 cortical dysplasia, it works a lot more, probably close to 70, 80%. But in type 1 cortical dysplasia, it's lower. It's probably 40 to 60%. And so when you average them together, you're about looking at a 50% success rate with cortical dysplasia operations. As your anecdote very, very eloquently described, what do we do next? What do we do with kids we thought had a discrete problem whether it be a hemispherectomy for HME or a lobectomy for cortical dysplasia, and they, and they recur, their seizures come back. What do we do next? What if we can't find where the seizures are coming from? What if they're coming from the other side? Okay. And if we can treat it with things other than surgery, like medication, it begs the question of, is cortical dysplasia really a surgical disease? And I wonder if 40, 50, 60 years from now, we will not be operating on cortical displays or we will be treating it medically once we know more about it. So I'm going to take you through some science that's going to explain how we got this idea of using mTOR inhibitors for things other than tuberous sclerosis. Okay. Then I'm going to lay the groundwork for a clinical trial that we did up here in Seattle. And then I'll show you some of the preliminary data, which hopefully will be published in the next few months. Um, we're just, we're waiting on our very last patient to complete the trial. If this gets too sciencey, like technical jargony sciencey, forgive me, I'm gonna try to be as um, not jargony as possible here. mTOR. mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. It is a protein. That protein exists in every single cell in your body. It is small, but it is important. And it regulates a wide variety of cellular processes. It has been implicated now in a variety of neurological diseases. The prototypical one is tuberous sclerosis, which is the one we know the most about. 
but also likely other forms of epilepsy, which is what I'm going to show you today, autism, tumors, trauma, Alzheimer's, the list goes on and on. But mTOR seems the more we look, the more it seems like it's implicated in a variety of disease states. Any talk about a protein or genetics or cellular pathways will show a slide like this. This slide shows you all the complex domino effect proteins that lead to mTOR being activated or deactivated. The one that could be most recognizable is this one right here. TSC1 and TSC2 are proteins that are dysfunctional in kids with tuberous sclerosis. And we've known about TS for over 100 years. We've known the genetics of TS for probably solidly known the genetics of TS for probably about 15 or 20 years. And we're still trying to figure out the nuances of it. But the idea is that in tuberous sclerosis, for example, one of those TSC1, TSC2 proteins gets inactivated because of a genetic mutation. And that leads to mTOR going wild, being unregulated, leading to the formation of tubers, epilepsy, intellectual cognitive disability, autism-like spectrum, <clears throat> tumors in a variety of organs, including the skin tumors we call sebaceous adenomas. These are all the different things that mTOR does. And I think the key here is just, it does a lot. It's important in every single cell in the body at very, very fundamental levels. Our prototypical disease state that we understand mTOR the most in is tuberous sclerosis, but most kids who require pediatric epilepsy surgery don't have TS. They have cortical dysplasia. It turns out that they're probably more similar than they are different. Whereas tuberous sclerosis is mTOR going wild all over the place in a variety of organs and at a different level. Cortical dysplasia is probably a pinpoint place in the brain, a select group of cells in a select location that have a problem with mTOR regulation or other genes. Some of the fantastic work that has been done by my colleagues here at Seattle Children's on human tissue, tissue that has been removed at the time of epilepsy surgery, has shown that these mutations are very, very common in kids who undergo epilepsy operations. We have found now upwards of 40 or 50% of kids undergoing a variety of epilepsy surgery operations have mutations in this pathway. The harder we look, the more we're finding them. The tricky part is it's hard to look and it's expensive to look and if these mutations only exist in very low levels in very select cells it can be very tricky to find it you have to do what's called deep sequencing which requires a lot of technical expertise manpower hours and money but the more we look the more we're finding So the first question that like we set out to answer in the lab, this is many years ago, was how do we get from mTOR, which is a 289 kilodalton, and it's a microscopic, very tiny protein, to a child with epilepsy? We started in the lab, and I'm just going to breeze through this, trying to figure out whether messing with mTOR changes the way nerve cells communicate. Can it make them more excitable, less excitable? What does it do? 
No one actually looked into this, even though we all had an idea that changes in the way mTOR works seem to lead to things like epilepsy. We had a variety of tools. We used the drug called rapamycin, which has been around for a long time. It inhibits mTOR. Um, it was originally indicated for things like preventing rejection after an organ transplant or for uh, renal cell cancer. That's where rapamycin got its FDA approval. And we also had animals that we genetically modified to look like cortical dysplasia or look like tuberous sclerosis and hyperactivate mTOR. We did experiments where we looked at what happens when you let mTOR go wild in nerve cells. It turns out that the nerve cells, they get bigger and they look just like the nerve cells we see in type two cortical dysplasia, which are big and very abnormal looking. And it turns out that if you give them rapamycin, they'll still start to shrink again. Not only does that have implications for the size of the cell, but believe it or not, the way a nerve conducts electricity, the way a nerve cell, a neuron conducts electricity, is in part dependent on its size. And the smaller it is, the more it will amplify electrical signals, and the bigger it is, the more it will dampen the electrical signals. So there's a direct relationship between the size of the nerve cell and the way it conducts electricity. Then we looked at neurotransmitters, and lo and behold, we found that in animals that have mTOR gone wild, their GABA signaling, which GABA is a very important inhibitory neurotransmitter, goes completely, it, it changes completely. It gets dampened, it gets small, less GABA-tory inhibit, GABA inhibitory neurotransmission. When you give them the drug that calms mTOR back down, that regulates mTOR back down, that GABA neurotransmission is restored. So we know that when we give mTOR inhibitors, it changes the way nerve cells communicate. Fundamentally, doesn't matter whether you have epilepsy or not, if you get an mTOR inhibitor, it will change the way your nerve cells communicate. It also changes how excitable these nerve cells are. Fundamentally changes the way they respond to activation. I'll leave it at that. What does all this mean? Well, it means that if we give an mTOR inhibitor to a child, it will act directly on the way nerve cells communicate, which is a little mind blowing because it's something no one had ever really thought would happen. Everyone knew that if you gave mTOR inhibitors to kids with TS, for instance, their SEGAs wouldn't get quite so big. And it seemed like their epilepsy was getting better, but we didn't really know why. And it seems that the reason why is because it's directly changing the way these nerve cells communicate. In animal studies, they've looked at rapamycin as a way to prevent the formation of epilepsy, or as what we call a disease-modifying drug, meaning it changes how severe the epilepsy is. It may prevent epilepsy from forming in the first place, and in some animal models, that are really well-known animal models of seizures, if you pre-treat them with rapamycin, you can't get them to start having seizures, which is really interesting. We know it already is out there for tuberous sclerosis because of the trials that were done over a decade ago. And now we're thinking about it for other things too, such as cognitive disorders or autism, or now epilepsy. Any questions about the basic science? before I get into the clinical trial. Um, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, I just need you to come up to the mic if it's okay. Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, can you uh, inhibit uh, mTOR too much? What happens if, if it's too inhibited or if it, it, does it just, you said if you inhibit it a little bit, it kind of calms it and allows for better uh, signaling. What happens if you go too far? It's actually quite complex the way mTOR at, at its end state behaves, it actually forms two complexes, complex one and complex two. 
and those two complexes, they talk to each other. And so sometimes if you inhibit complex one, complex two activity will go up. But if you give a lot of mTOR inhibitor, like heavy, heavy doses, we think both complexes get shut down. You kind of crush them both. No one necessarily, I don't know that no one can, I don't know that I can answer the question of what, what it would look like if you did too much. I don't know if it's possible because of the pharmacological limitations of these drugs. Um, I'll give you, I, I give you one thing that's really interesting is that someone did this study over a decade ago where they gave uh, mice, realizing mice are not human beings, but they gave mice rapamycin. They, these mice had nothing wrong with it, nothing wrong with it. They just gave them rapamycin and to see what would happen. And it turned out the mice lived longer than all the other mites. We think it has to do with the way mTOR uh, interacts with uh, the cell cycle and, and nutrient consumption and toxin removal and that kind of thing. But it's actually pretty wild. You give this drug to animals, they seem to live longer than animals that don't get rapamycin. So it actually prolongs lifespan in animals. Any other questions about the science? Okay. About five or six years ago, when I came up to the UW, my partner, Jeff Ogeman, also an epilepsy surgeon, he and I were sitting down and he's like, Jay, it's really cool work that you did in the lab. Why don't you start doing it in people? And at first I was like, you have to understand PhDs generally a lot of them perceive this huge gap between what's done in the laboratory and what's done with patients. I have thus learned that that gap is nowhere near as wide as I ever thought it was, but it is wide. And so in a way that was like a mind blowing question for me, but as a neurosurgeon, we kind of had this like get it done mentality. And so I was like, yeah, sure, let's try. And the FDA let us. And so. The next couple of slides I'm going to show you are a result, really, of that conversation. Okay. Bringing it back to the beginning, epilepsy is really common. Up to a third of children will have medically refractory epilepsy. Our surgical outcomes are highly variable, even though our techniques are getting better. And unfortunately, it doesn't really matter whether it's uh, like a laser ablation or an open disconnection. The results are variable because the pathology, the reason why we're doing these surgeries is variable. And it has a little bit less to do with the technique and more to do with the underlying problem. We know for the most part, for instance, that kids who get hemispherectomies to have unilateral hemispheric epilepsy, most will do quite well. We know that most who have temporal lobe epilepsy and a lesion, they'll do amazing. You take out the temporal lobe tumor, you take out the temporal lobe cortical dysplasia, 80 plus percent will be seizure free. But we also know that those that have lesions or not lesions, but epilepsy arising from outside the temporal lobe, they don't do as well with epilepsy surgery. And it seems like if we can't see the lesion on the MRI, they don't do quite as well as when we can. Like I was saying earlier, what is the lesion? What is cortical dysplasia? We're limited by how well we can see with an MRI. Now we've gotten better. We have higher field strength MRIs. We have all kinds of new sequences. We have a lot of stuff that I play with clinically like functional connectivity or white matter imaging and they've all helped, but there's still a significant portion that we call, we call non-lesional or MRI negative, meaning that we think something's there but we can't really see it. Type one cortical dysplasia is the best example of this dilemma not being able to see, but knowing it's there. And then it begs the question of like, well, what's really the lesion? Is the lesion that thing you see on the MRI or is it really the DNA change, the mutation, the metabolic, genomic, proteinomic change of all that stuff I showed you in the last couple of slides. And I would argue that it's that, that's the lesion. The lesion is not the one and a half centimeter cortical dysplasia that, that your surgeon is showing you on the MRI. That's not the lesion. The lesion is on the microscopic level, at the level of the DNA, that's leading to the epilepsy. 
One thing that has plagued us all as epilepsy surgeons, like we talked about, is what do we do with children that we thought had lesional epilepsy, MRI positive or MRI negative? We do an epilepsy surgery like a resection and the seizures come back. And quite frankly, we don't have great options. We cycle through anti-seizure medicines, we do VNS, we do RNS, we do DBS, those are all palliative, they're not curative. We give up on the notion of complete control. And a lot of kids, unfortunately, will suffer the history, the natural history of epilepsy. Things like SUDEP risk or neurodevelopmental decline or epileptic encephalopathy. And because of that, that frustration that we don't really have options, that really pushed us to look for more, more answers, more options for kids who were, had the epilepsy operation and didn't have the outcome that we all hoped for. <clears throat> like I was saying, mTOR exists everywhere. We're finding it in up to 40% of our kids who've had resective epilepsy surgery. And so we designed a clinical trial. There's a phase one clinical trial using an intravenous mTOR inhibitor called ABI-009. It's made by a company called Adi, AADI in California. And we wanted to give it to kids who were surgical failures and see if we could help some of them. But the thing about a phase one clinical trial is that the goal is not to show an effect. We'd like to see one if we can, but the goal is can we prove that we can safely give mTOR inhibitors to kids with epilepsy? And I know that sounds like, well, why do you have to ask that question? Well, mTOR inhibitors traditionally have been used in the cancer world. And they're, they're anti-neoplastic, they're anti-cancer agents, the way the FDA thinks about them. Even with tuberous sclerosis, the original trials for Everolimus, they were not for seizures. They were for a tumor that occurs in kids with tuberous sclerosis called a SACA. And so when I approached the FDA, they were at first like really reluctant to let me give this to kids who have epilepsy and don't have brain tumors because they don't think of it as an anti-seizure medication. We were able to convince them to let us give it to them as a safety and tolerability study. And um, the goal in the short term was, can we give it to them without any significant side effects and maybe we could see some improvement in a couple of kids. And that's kind of what we set out to do. No one had ever really tried to give an mTOR inhibitor outside of tuberous sclerosis for kids with epilepsy before. Whenever you do a clinical trial, you have objectives and you have endpoints. The objectives are like the broad, broad strokes. We were looking for what we call dose limiting toxicity. So it's trying to find the dose, trying to find what that what the maximum tolerated dose is, like can't go any higher, or the side effects become too great. And then to look at adverse events, which are side effects. What we did uh, was we identified kids who were candidates who had, had uh, epilepsy surgery with the intent to cure. So cortical dysplasia, you know, hemimegalencephaly, um, uh, other, you know, gliosis, stroke, other, uh, other etiologies we allowed in, but these were kids who had an epilepsy operation that we thought was going to cure them, but it did. Okay. Our ages were three to 26. They had to be at least three months out of their surgery and still having seizures. And we had them keep an epilepsy diary and we did some behavioral indices and some labs. Everything I'm about to show you right now is unpublished. So uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you guys digest it, but realize that this has not been put into a paper yet. We did a dose finding design, three different doses, and we escalated them every time we got three kids enrolled in the study. So we had three kids at a very low dose, we had three kids at a moderate dose, and then we had three kids at a high dose, 20 milligrams per unit squared. I also enrolled another three kids, all of whom had tuberous sclerosis on this medication, okay? There, I'm, I kind of consider them a separate category because in TS, we know what the genetic issue is, I expect it to work for them, okay? And so, but, but we didn't enroll three of them as well. The, the, the great news 
is that at all three doses, we had no significant dose limiting side effects. Everything was mild, mild nosebleeds, mild skin rash. We had the, the mucosal sores that you see in kids who have PS who are on Everolimus. We saw that and it was easily managed with mouthwash. Of the first eight kids that we had enrolled that did not have tuberous sclerosis, I'm going to show you, I want you to concentrate on the kids on the left. These kids only got a drug for four weeks, which is a limitation because some of the non-responders, if I had them on drug for longer, maybe we would have seen an effect, but the FDA only let me give it for four weeks. What's really cool is that graph to the left. These are three patients who had no other options, nothing. They failed epilepsy surgery. They were on multiple anti-seizure medicines, continuing to have seizures. And in those three patients, this drug helped considerably. Perhaps the most dramatic is, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about her in a second. But all three of these patients responded to drug and when they were taken off the drug, their seizures came back. So they were on their home medication for the first four weeks. Then they were put on drug, I'm sorry, for the first three months, uh, for the first month. Then they were put on drug for four weeks and then they were taken off drug for three months. That's what you're looking at there, okay? P06 is our most dramatic success story. P06 is the only subject that we had genetic information on. She had hemimegalencephaly and underwent a hemispherectomy. It turns out that she has a mutation in the mTOR pathway. That enzyme that she has a mutation is called AKT3, which is in that pathway. She was having about 100 seizures a week prior to being on the mTOR inhibitor. She has been seizure free for over a year and a half on drug. The first three patients had a significant enough effect that the FDA allowed us to do an open label extension, meaning I was allowed to keep them on drug indefinitely. And so we have. P06 has been our most incredible response. Uh, P04 and P01 have had significant improvement in their epilepsy, but they're still having some seizures. But P06 is a rock star. This is what it looks like on the open label extension. And this is this is old data now. I have close to two years worth of data on drug. But this is old data. Look at P06. Pretty incredible. Um, P01, P05 sustained reduction in their seizures, but P06 pretty amazing, AKT3 mutation. So I just kind of breezed through it. The, the thing I'm not showing you because I didn't know how interested this conference would be in it because I don't know how many uh, TS families you guys have as part of the Brain Recovery Project, but I have three kids with TS, tuberous sclerosis, who are on my open label extension who are also seizure free on drug, on the open label. I can speculate as to why I think that is, but that's better than Everolimus considerably. Um, and I think it has to do with the way this drug works. Um, it's just, it's a much more potent mTOR inhibitor than Everolimus is. Um, but all three of my TS kids are on open label and seizure free. I think my first TS kid is probably about six months on an open label, seizure free. And all of them had had epilepsy surgery as well. What we take from this study is that it's safe, it's well tolerated. It works in a subset for sure. It may work in more than a subset, but we didn't give it long enough to really know. But that wasn't the point of the study. The point was to show that it's safe so that we can do a bigger study where we look at efficacy, how well it works. I need to understand dosing. I'm still trying to figure that out. And um, I want to know which patients benefit the most. And I think the key to that is understanding the genetics 
understanding what the mutation is at the time of the brain operation so that we know it, so that we can treat with the appropriate drug. Not everyone who has cortical dysplasia or, or refractory epilepsy is going to have an mTOR mutation. There are multiple other pathways that we think are involved, but I bet up to half of them have an mTOR mutation, and that could be a considerable number of kids that we can help. Um, there are lots of further directions for this, and like I said, I'm showing you very raw stuff, but um, the goal is to do more, to do bigger, to do better. Um, try to help as many kids as we can. Uh, this is my family. Uh, this is yesterday, riding uh, in 110 degree heat in Zion. Um, my three kids, Avery, Cooper, and Marley, and my wife, Susan, and me trying to be cowboys for a couple hours. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all. I am happy to field questions, and um, I'm happy to be contacted by email as well if you don't want to ask in front of other people. Totally cool. Jason period Houtman at seattlechildrens.org is my email address. And um, I, I, I wish you and your families, your children, the very best. Thank you. I do have a question. Uh, yeah. you, is this mic for or do you think this mic for Toronto? Can you hear me all right? I can. The mic, the mic is super helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for talking today. Uh, uh, and I don't know how to exactly phrase this question. Um, my surgery, uh, my son had a TPO lobectomy, unfortunately not at Seattle Children's, but we're getting followed up by Dr. Novotny and uh, Dr. Ojiman right now. Um, what I hate is the anxiety I have towards wondering if he's going to become a data point towards uh, a return to seizures. And I'm wondering if there's anything I can do or we can do to, um, uh, you know, go in for additional or a, a a new PET scan because I seem to remember from his workups that maybe there are some hot spots showing up on other sites, other lobes. Um, would there be anything that we can do to try to figure out if he's going to fall into this or genetic sequencing um, uh, to prevent that or try to stave that from uh, happening? Does that question make sense? It, it does a little bit. So I, I'm going to refrain. I'm going to talk, say it back to you so that I make sure I'm answering. The question you're asking. Okay. You're asking, so you're saying your son had a TPO lobectomy and you're concerned about recrudescence of his seizures and you want to know what could you do to predict or not a recurrence of epilepsy and if so, what we would do next? Part Does his, that sound right to you? Part of his predict, part of his prevent. Yep. Um, okay. Or just, uh, I, I don't like waiting around to see a seizure to happen. Uh, I would rather try to uh, prevent that from happening in the first place. And is there anything that we can do? I, uh, you talked about genetic sequencing, and is there, like, would he be a candidate for getting on inhibitors um, uh, prophylactically? And I, I realize that research probably hasn't been done yet, but, uh, but that's, I guess, where my mind's going. The question about whether to prophylactically put kids on drug at the time of or after surgery is an answer. Years ago, Howie Weiner, who's a, a TS expert, um, at, and now at Texas Children's, back when he was at NYU, he did a study where he put kids on an mTOR inhibitor at the time of their tuberous sclerosis surgery, and it didn't really seem like doing it prophylactically changed their outcomes a whole lot. It seems like maybe if you're destined to fail surgery, it, it may happen regardless of whether you're on drug at the time of the operation. Now, I think the one thing that you could do, that I would do, is try to see if we can get a hold of any tissue at the time of the resection to sequence. Depending on where it was done, there may be a biobank. And if there is, that could be the one avenue that would give you information that may or may not be actionable right now, but would be really helpful in the future. It's no different than in the cancer world where we don't have drugs that treat every single mutation that we see in a brain tumor, but we know it's coming. And so having that information now could arm you 
uh, for potential treatments in the future, okay. if that makes sense. That does make sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, this is really weird. <laughs> so I am here because my daughter has left hemimeglencephaly. Um, she is seen in Colorado Springs, but we travel to Cincinnati for all of her actual big treatments. And at six weeks old, they put her on Zortress. Um, since she's been on Zortress, it's been night and day. Like that is, that is our godsend completely. Um, I ended up going to a VNS for her. I had to choose bef between a hemispherotomy or a VNS, and I chose the VNS because she is so high, well functioning and and doing so well. But the seizure she does have last hours, and and they don't stop. Nothing helps. Not even the rescue meds. Um, so what we noticed was that when she got off, just like what you said, as soon as she got off the meds before the seizure or before the surgery, then she um, started having rapid seizures again. And a couple weeks afterwards, until it kicked back in, she started having them. And so I guess like through this process, I, I clearly am very pro the inhibitors. There's something about it that is working for her but I don't want to cut her head open to figure out the genetic part. Like how can we figure out what other key components there are to help her without having to do such an invasive process to be a part of that research to help? Because there's a reason why she's doing so well, but we don't know why. You can, well, I, I, I can imagine, <clears throat> well, she has about a 50% chance of having a mutation in the PI3K you know, PI3K, AKT, and through pathway, having hemimegalocephaly. So starting her on Everolimus is a very, very reasonable thing to do because the odds are quite strong that she has a mutation in that pathway and likely is the reason why you're seeing some improvement. As far as knowing the genetics, at present, we don't have substitute methods other than looking at brain tissue. We're working on it. We're working on trying to figure it out from the CSF um, I've tried, one thing I've tried doing is I've tried washing electrodes from stereo electroencephalography. It's very, very hard because the DNA levels in the CSF or on the washed electrodes are so low. They're so low that it's really, really hard to detect a mutation that's occurring already, even in the brain tissue, at a very low rate. Um, and so at present, we don't have, we're working on it. It's probably the best thing I could tell you. I think we'll probably have something in the next five to 10 years to diagnose in a less invasive way. Um, one thing that I have entertained doing, I have not done yet, is I am thinking about doing biopsies at the time. Of, has anybody in the room had stereo EEG? Do you guys know what stereo EEG is? Yes. The minimally invasive electrode? approach with the robot. Um, I, I'm, I'm entertaining getting tissue at the time with stereo EEG, which is much less invasive than doing like a big open brain surgery. But I mean, those things are very, very preliminary. Um, the thing about HME that you already know better than me is that you are at a difficult crossroads because the hemispherectomy does have, unfortunately, has the highest probability of seizure freedom of any therapeutic approach that we have right now. If Even if I knew that she had an AKT or an mTOR mutation, putting her on like the study drug would be, would, would be possible, but challenging, but possible. And Everolimus, and this is the life you're living right now, I think, I, everyone, this is good, but it's not great for this condition. It is, it, it has pharmacologically, the way that drug works is probably not potent enough in the cerebral spinal fluid to see the same effects that I saw, for instance, in P06 on my study. I don't know that for sure. I don't have the scientific backing for that, but that is like, that's my hypothesis about it and why you saw some improvement on Zortris, but not complete resolution of the epilepsy. It could also be that she has more than one gene involved, which is possible too. 
Um, the hardest decision for every parent of a child with HME, of course, is do the HEMI or don't do the HEMI. And with the HEMI, you always worry about the other side, you know? Um, and I think that that's a legitimate worry. I mean, this is the conversation I just had literally last week with the parents of this a four week old baby were exactly this. I am I'm hoping that there the day will come where I will put myself out of business, you know, for this and not be doing any hemis anymore. Um, and I think we're headed in that direction, but we, we need to know more. We, we're just not quite there yet. Um, but that's the future I want for your child, you know. With um, all due respect, I don't want you to do your job anymore either. Find us a cure. <laughs> help us for save our babies so thank you you're welcome hey sir quick question um two second background hme uh brain surgery multiple ablations still having seizures you said that the mutations are in 50 percent of hme patients who else is doing the mutation tests besides Seattle Children's, and I think I think you said something about you know it's fairly expensive, it's hard to see, and and, and such like that. But who else is doing it besides Seattle Children's? Um, you know, to be honest with you, I, I am not entirely certain who's doing it in the research. No one's doing it. We just started. We just just developed a a, a panel, a, a PCR panel that we're using clinically. Um, but otherwise, it's research. There are a handful of other places around the country. UCLA um, actually, I think in part, collaborates with us uh, genetically. Um, there are a couple other places in the country that might be offering genetics. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head who's doing it routinely, to be totally honest. The two that I ran into in our research was UCLA has a hemimagal encephaly program. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did our sequencing at Washington University they have a brain, a brain malformation panel that looks for mTOR and a bunch of other genes. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, just listening to you talk, I feel like my daughter's like a perfect candidate and I'm just figuring out how to get this like test at Texas Children's or I'll fly to Seattle, whatever. Well, I, I lost the video. I, I Somehow I lost the video here, but um, uh, the, first of all, we're happy to, I'm happy to connect you with, with my partner in genetics in Seattle. Um, UCLA has a genetic collaboration with us that goes back many years. Um, the uh, Your head's in the right place. I think that, you know, having that information, being armed with that information can only help. It Correct. can't hurt. Right. Um, the, the other site that was mentioned, WashU, is fantastic too. Um, I, I'm friends and colleagues with with the guys there. They do terrific genetic work. Um, I don't know how everyone at the other sites is dealing with insurance authorization. We have a process here uh, in which, if we can't get it done clinically, we do it with research funds. So. Um, that could be an avenue that could be explored for you. Okay, and then if you could spell your last name again. Okay, never mind. I got it. Okay, great. Thanks again. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. I, I feel like it's washrooms repeating here. Also, daughter with uh, left hemimegalencephaly, functional hemispherotomy two additional resections conversion to anatomical, um, obviously because we didn't obtain seizure freedom. She still has seizures, but currently is controlled, but of course that's on some significant medications. And so I'm curious about a couple of things. From your perspective, do you potentially see these inhibitors as being able to potentially replace sort of the, the mainstream anti-epileptic drugs that come with consequences? Um, to maintain seizure control? I do. Okay. I do. I, my, my, um, that's exciting. I, mean, I, I feel like yeah. that's exciting. My perhaps, my, my perhaps foolhardy view, and it, my, I, I may be foolish for saying this and 10 years from now, totally be wrong. But my, my view is that there will be a day 
where the traditional anti-epileptics will be all dated. Um, the way I describe it to patients is that the traditional anti-seizure medicine is like hitting a finishing nail right. with a 12 pound sledgehammer. Yeah. Will it get the job done? Yeah. Will it destroy your thumb in the process? Absolutely. And the reason is because all of the physiologic medications that work on ion channels, they don't differentiate between diseased and non-diseased right. nerve cells. Right, right. And that's so, why you get all those gnarly side effects that every parent of every child with epilepsy hates. Right, right. So then my other question is, are there additional ongoing studies anywhere that, that appropriate candidates could potentially be involved with moving forward? We are going to have a phase two um, in which we're going to be looking at efficacy. I am very much interested in seeing kids who have HME who have failed surgery um, because I, first of all, I know what your options look like and we need, we need more of them. And I think there's a very high likelihood of a genetic mutation that could potentially respond to this medication. Um, so I, I would say, yes, there is, it's coming, it's coming. Finding money to do these clinical trials is very challenging right. because um, the disease is not big enough right. for a lot of the drug companies to want to drop a lot of coin, unfortunately. Um, and um, a lot of times what we end up, oh, and the NIH, as great as the NIH is, the NIH is not interested in comparative effectiveness treatment trials. It's not, it's not what they do. They do basic science. Yeah. And so a lot of the times what I end up having to do, not just me, but everyone in this field, is we find either young drug companies that are looking for partners in clinical trials, or we use things that are FDA labeled off label as a trial right and that's how we study them and so it's coming what i would say is that there will be options hopefully in the next year um, I, i'm i'm hopeful to have the groundwork for a phase two okay great thank you so much thank you i just i know there's more questions uh if you guys have questions um dr jason hauptman j-a-s-o-n dot h-a-u p-t-m-a-n at seattle children's org. Um, thank you so, so much for coming and talking to us today. This has been uh, tremendously impactful for me and I think hopefully for others as well. Um, I would love for everybody, please remember there's a, a bit.ly link and a QR code. If you were in the session, please uh, scan this and fill out your feedback at the end of the session. And um, I just want to give you a big hand. Thank you so much, Dr. Halpern. I really appreciate you guys inviting me. Feel free to email me. You're not you're not intrusive. You're not bothering me. I am happy to hear about your you, your child, your journey. Um, just let me know how I can help.